welcome and good evening. Or should I say, top of the evening, lads and lassies. <laughs> welcome to Hedford Public Library for tonight's program, Finding Your Roots from Ireland to Janesville. I'm Sue Braden, my colleague Diana McDonald. Stand up, Diana, again. We are reference librarians here at Hedberg, along with Melissa Carollo. Melissa is in the back. She's also a reference librarian, and she's also our adult programming librarian. So the three of us are happy to welcome you here tonight. Whether you're Irish or not, we hope you enjoy the program. Nate is here from our local cable TV channel, JATV. Wave to Nate in the back. Uh, he, they are recording this evening's program, and it will air later this month on channel 98 or 994 if you have HD. Thank you, Nate, for being here. We also thank the unseen library staff who helped with tonight's program, with setting up the room, with promoting, and all the little things in between. So uh, tonight you'll learn tips about Irish history and genealogy, how to find information about your ancestors, both here and abroad. Our first uh, guest is, will, is here briefly. His name's David Haldeman. Mr. Haldeman has been researching the Irish in Janesville, and tomorrow evening will be presenting uh, a documentary film he produced here at the Pontiac Convention Center in Janesville and he's also published a book and both will be available uh, for purchase and he's going to speak briefly this evening about uh, making the film so welcome Mr. Haldeman This, uh, the project that I, I uh, the documentary, which is, actually has a, a different name. Uh, we, I named the book, High Our Hopes and Start Our Heart, Stout Our Hearts. The documentary is named uh, Where Nature Seems to Smile, both of which are drawn from songs, which were written by Irishmen uh, back in the uh, 19th century. Or actually, um, this one is from a song written by a, um, I think it's John Conley. He was a unionist uh, who died in the 1916 yeah, Patrick Conley, yeah, um, that in the 1916 revolution. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, these, one of the first things I did when I started working on the documentary and book was starting to research things like these songs and the poems and the, the, uh, the ways that the Irish express themselves through songs and poetry because this is really, you know, if, if there's a, a way that the Irish have sort of exported their their national character in a lot of ways it has been through, you know, these, uh, through, their, through their songs. Um, or, you know, the songs which are just poems put to music. And some of this stuff is really quite beautiful. I mean, there's a great reservoir of emotion in there. Um, you know, people who profoundly love their country. Uh, and yet, <clears throat> so many of them left their country. You know, there's a real paradox there. Why did they leave their country? Well, because Ireland despite being a really beautiful country with lovely people, um, had went through some periods of really, really awful times. Um, the best one, best known one, is the uh, potato famine, of course, uh, when <clears throat> more than, well, roughly a million people died uh, in Ireland from starvation and disease over a period of just maybe about six years. Imagine that. Um, and. Ireland, uh, there was um, a, a, a census taken, I think, around 1830, which uh, showed a little more than 8 million people in Ireland. Another census taken around 1890 uh, or 1900, which showed about 4.2 million people in the, in the country. Uh, or four point, it was just a little bit less than a 50%, about a 48% drop in the population during that time. Um, and it wasn't all people just <laughs> dying. Uh, it was people leaving, too. I mean, during that short span of the Great Potato Famine and a few years afterward, uh, a million, between a million and a million and a half people left. Um, now, so think about, you know, a country of about eight million people or so, uh, and that many people are just gone. Suddenly, 25% of the population is just, has just disappeared. 
Uh, and so there's this terrible paroxysm you know, of, of just of misery that drove people out of this, this country. But it happened at a very particular time for Janesville, too, at a very fortuitous time for Janesville, frankly. Um, you know, Ireland's great loss was Janesville's great gain because um, the Great Potato Famine happened at the time when uh, Janesville was becoming a city. And so the people who were leaving Ireland, uh, a lot of them settled on the East Coast, and then they started working their way westward as the western frontier moved out you know, through the territories in the new states, um, you know, in the central part of the United States, what's now the central part of the United States. And you know, Janesville was a frontier town. It was, uh, you know, started out with a couple of log cabins. And some of the, not the first inhabitants, but the almost first inhabitants of Janesville were Irish immigrants. Uh, and they came at a time when Ireland needed people to work, and that's what the Irish did. For, I mean, to put things very, very simply, the Irish worked hard, doing things that a lot of other people didn't want to do. You know, I mean, in New York, they dug the subways. Um, <clears throat> then, as railroads worked their way westward across the continent, they built the railroads. You know, during every, se every season, they worked every season building the railroads. You know, during the winter they would cut the trees um, and, and form them into the ties and the bridge um, planks, you know, the, 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 the posts and the, the planks for the bridges. In the warmer seasons they would put them in, they'd put the rails across. It was backbreaking work. A lot of people died doing this kind of stuff, but they just kept working. And these are the people who, you know, built a lot of the infrastructure of Janesville, but they also gave their character you know, that really, that, that beautiful, evocative um, character that Irish have to, um, to the city. Um, they gave this really, um, this, this strong devotion that they have to family and church. They gave this um, playfulness, you know, having fun, you know, going out to the saloons and, and getting out there and meeting, meeting, your, meeting everybody and, and exchanging their stories. Um, I mean, some of the great storytellers, of course, have been Irish. And you can imagine, you know, what one of these saloons, like, you know, Sheridan's saloon would have been like, you know, in, in 1870, with these people getting together over beer and just exchanging stories. It would have been, you know, a lot of fun. Uh, and so, <clears throat> I learned these things by doing research, but by also, a, a lot of what I learned was from talking to people in Janesville who have done genealogical research and who know a lot about their their families. Um, uh, they know a fair amount about their families after their families arrived in the United States. It's harder to learn some of these things back in Ireland because uh, records, well, I'm sure that's, that's your bailiwick, but, um, uh, but still, a lot of, you know, nearly everybody I talk to, and I talk to about 20, 25 people, nearly all of them had been back to Ireland. This is really quite amazing because when the Irish first arrived, um, in the United States, a lot of them just didn't want to acknowledge their Irishness. There was a lot of um, discrimination against Irish because, you know, you can imagine, you know, these eastern cities where people had been there for a few generations, especially people of British heritage had been there for a few generations, suddenly all these people show up, poor, a lot of them not so well educated, um, destitute, hundreds of thousands, boom. You know, and it's like, oh, yeah, well, I mean, there is going to be some discrimination. Um, and um, there was a point here. Just kind of wafted off. Somebody sees it. Uh, let me know. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, going back to Ireland. Yeah, thanks. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but a lot of people have been able to find the ship's records. This is, you know, one thing that's really good about people coming to the United States, although a lot of Irish came to Canada first. It was cheaper coming to Canada, for one thing. Also, some of them were sent to Canada. Ireland was basically an agricultural colony for Great Britain um, at that time, and the landlords oftentimes were these titled Brits, Brit Britons, um, who uh, owned you know, 80,000 acres or something, and they had 1,000 peasants working on their land. And the English crown at one point, or the English court said, you know, you're responsible for these people. And it, they found that it was cheaper for them to put people on boats and send them back across to the New World than it was to take responsibility for them on the land or in the poorhouses during the potato famine. 
Um, so some of them came to Canada. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> uh, but you know, there are a lot of records. And so people that I spoke with went back and found these records, uh, you know, Ellis Island and places like that. Um, and they've, it, it, they were able to tell their stories that they compiled from relatives, that they, you know, people had maybe written a letter to somebody, and it might be a third cousin. And they found that third cousin, and that third cousin said, well, I have a letter from our great-great-grandfather who wrote this in 1860 about his childhood, you know, in, in County Monaghan. And so that's how I started to compile information about these families, too. And it's really quite great. Um, I'll just leave you with one story. Uh, one guy, uh, an O'Leary, um, here in Janesville, went back. This was in the 90s. He went back, and he toured around um, Ireland. And he noticed that there were all these castle ruins all over the place. And so the, the tour guide was you know, saying they'd, they'd drive up to one castle ruin. He said, well, the Vikings sacked this one. And they'd drive up to another one. He said, well, you know, King Edward's troops burned this one to the ground. And they went to so many, so many different castle ruins that he began to wonder if the, Ir uh, the Irish were even capable of winning a battle. You know, they just, I mean, all of their castles, almost all of their castles seem to be in ruins. Um, but there are still a lot of great castles standing there. All right, well, tomorrow evening, um, there's going to be at Pontiac Convention Center uh, the great unveiling of, the, of this book and the documentary that goes with it. And I encourage you to come. Thank you. All right, next we'll have our featured speaker, Daniel Kane. His lengthy bio biography is in the program. I'll mention some highlights. He's the founder and sole proprietor of Extended Family Ties. He's a native Chicagoan with Irish, French, English, and Scottish roots. He was raised in suburban Oak Park, Illinois, graduated from Loras, Loras College in Dubuque, Iowa, and has lived in Indiana, Florida, New Jersey, and Missouri for short stretches of his life. He spent two years in the Army and had tours of Vietnam and Germany as a military journalist. He's been researching his own family history. In 1999, he retired from a 25-year customer service career at the Chicago Transit Authority. He's traveled to the British Isles four times since 1985 and has had great success visiting various ancestral hometowns. And he's a lifetime member of the Illinois State Genealogical Society and several other organizations. Um, and they are currently residents in Oak Park, Illinois, he and his wife. So welcome, Daniel Kane. In order to keep all these Irish people out of mischief, I put a lot of things on the chairs that you could be looking at so you wouldn't get into little spats and whatnot. But it's great to see such a variety of generations here. I see at least three and a half, four generations represented. And that's one of my biggest gripes about genealogy is that nobody ever starts young enough. And when you get to be my age, then you start, the eyes start to fail and the hearing and all that. But you still have that enthusiasm. And um, I would hope that uh, any of you that might think you're on the far side of uh, midlife would have already picked out somebody in your family that you will pass all your... Uh, wisdom onto. Um, I've got four drawers in, in a couple of file cabinets for each one of my four grandparents' lines, and I have a label on them that says, if anything should happen to me, make sure Cousin Sally in Wachahachi, Texas gets all this stuff. Otherwise, you all know where stuff goes when people die. So um, that, that's got to be my missionary statement of the night. <laughs> Now, I'm curious, and I, when I talk to a group, I always want to know, how many of you live in corporate Janesville itself? And then, okay, uh, put your hands down. How many live in Rock County, but not Janesville? Okay, and then outside of Rock County, we got a few? Okay, good. Well, I, on some of your chairs, for the folks outside of Rock County and, and anybody else that's interested, I did leave one of the societies I belong to, uh, coming events, but it wasn't just their society. It's McHenry County, and they usually meet in Crystal Lake or Woodstock. Um, but I, what I didn't bring, I forgot to bring, and that's kind of how I got connected to your organization and 
your town was Big Will. Has anybody ever heard of Big Will? That's a serious genealogist. There's another one. Okay. I probably should recognize your faces, too, from some of the meetings. But uh, it stands for British Interest Group of Wisconsin and Illinois, and it has meetings every two months on a Saturday, and they meet in Richmond, which is a nice compromise because it's uh, right on the border, uh, barely in Illinois, really. And even some of us Chicago types get there for their meetings. But they really, uh, they'll, they'll do Scotch, Irish, Welsh, and um, British, English. So I feel blessed that I have all those uh, nationalities. Do we have anybody here that's 100% Irish? Like four, your, all four of your grandparents have Irish? And three back there, congratulations. We put that sign over there on the table on the left there on purpose because it covers the Welsh, the Scottish, the English, and the Irish. And it's, it's a little dig at each one of them. So whoever wrote it was very magnanimous. The thing they said about the Irish was they will fight to the death even though they're not sure what they're fighting for. <laughs> but they're, they're going to always be right there. So to celebrate that spirit, this... Um, 100 most numerous surnames. David mentioned uh, 1890 when they took the census, it was down to 4 million thanks to the uh, famine. And I'm wondering, do we have anybody here with a Murphy in their family tree? Okay, somewhere. Doesn't have to be your, your surname. That's the most popular one. How about any Kellys? Got some Kellys over there. Sullivan, how about? Okay, there's, a, how about a Walsh or two? Okay, any Smiths? <laughs> if you, if, yeah, the, the Smith is a good uh, indicator of something that, that's very popular in Ireland. Some of the biggest names, and even some of mine that aren't that common, like Sheehy, are uh, potentially English names originally. And they just happened to get it to Ireland so long ago that it's associated with. And then Smith is a kind of generic name anyway. Uh, for any town. O'Brien. I know we've got some O'Briens. Yeah, there's one. And Burn. I didn't know Burn was that popular. Ryan. A. Okay. Connor or O'Connor. You know, just add the O or the Mick. Okay. And uh, last but not least, O'Neill. Uh, two, three. Okay. So as you can see, there's a there's hundred of them. And I had this list before and it just listed them the hundred, and it didn't say how many exactly there were. So I'm proud to say that I'm mo bo both of mine are on the back, and number 72 is Kane, the right way to spell it. And then uh, Kane with an E, anybody have that spelling? Um, is number, what, 94, 85. Uh, so I combine the two, and that pushes me up the chart a little bit. But <laughs> the point there is, um, did you notice Keefe on there? It's number, uh, yeah, 92. Kind of looks weird, doesn't it? Two Fs. Well, the, the story there is there's no right way to spell an Irish name, and there's no wrong way. <laughs> and I won't say it's because the British kept us from going to school for 300 years, but... Um, there was a certain liberal attitude uh, at the baptismal font and uh, anywhere else that a name would get registered that uh, spells itself out pretty easily. McGuan, for example, is, could be McGuain or McGowan at some point. So a map like this uh, that you'll see quite often with all the Irish names on it uh, might have a different spelling of the name that you're really derived from. Um, always start with yourself, I guess. And that's a good lesson for genealogy in general. Uh, David mentioned that uh, when the Irish people got here, they first didn't really care that much about talking about how Irish they were. I have a letter from one of my uh, ancestral cousins that he wrote in 1924 after coming in 1885, maybe, and he had gone back to Ireland to visit, and he was writing back to the States saying, what a crappy country Ireland is and how the heat is bad, every room is damp and this and that. He just didn't like uh, going back to the old side. And I found that as a teenager, a curious teenager, that I couldn't get stuff out of my mom and my uh, aunts uh, 
my dad was 100% Irish, and he had the, I had the misfortune of him dying when I was four years old. So, and he was from Louisville. So, you know, every cane in Chicago says, oh, you've got to be connected to the fire engine canes or the cop cane. Oh, no, no, none of them. You know, they're all from Kentucky. But I, so I, I kind of zeroed in on my mother's side, and uh, they gave me a few things. And my mother got Alzheimer's in her last 15 years, and so I had to slowly take care of stuff in the house. And I've in her closet, I'm sure there's a story or 10 out there about this, was a bag of stuff. And it was her uncle who used to visit us um, at our house and loved to talk about Ireland. And I just sit there with big eyes and, and get the stories out of them and everything. Well, he had written down, he had talked to his mother, who was born in 1844, and she knew back to the 1700s. So she took like four or five branches of the family and wrote detailed family trees. So this was sitting in my mother's closet and she had never told me about it. So that got me going in to the point where I got my Irish citizenship in, eight, in 1990. And somebody challenged me on this the other day. You can do that still. As long as you have one grandparent that was born in Ireland, you can qualify for Irish citizenship. Cost me $300 back in 1990, but uh, it might be a little more now. But I, I did it at the consulate in uh, Chicago, and I'm sure either Milwaukee or Madison has one. And while I think of it, you are lucky to be in this town and in this state because there's a really strong Irish community in Milwaukee and Madison. You've got a great library there. And even St. Paul and, of course, lovely Chicago, which uh, we have a handout or two back there about uh, the Irish American Heritage Center, for example. Anyway, so as, as I was talking, uh, th this is also a handout back there, and it shows me and my brother on the far left, uh, on typical pedigree chart. And uh, if you go down, that's my mother's side, and then up is uh, my dad's crowd. And the sad thing is I have yet to pinpoint where the Kane family is from. You know, I've got all these other lines in really good shape and all I've been able to find out with the Canes is that there was Nicholas Kane, who uh, is the top right name on there and he married a woman named Catherine Sheehy and I've had better luck with his wife and know that they're from around Limerick or south of Limerick, Listowel in County Kerry, which is near um, Killarney, which is a great tourist town. How many of you have been to Ireland at least once, more than once? Uh, yeah? Okay, so you know that there's just, it, it's not like my cousin wrote in 1924. It's, it's really cool. But I, I went from 1985, as David mentioned, and, and Sue mentioned, uh, till 1999, I went four different times. And in that small period of time, it was amazing how much the Irish learned about how to market themselves. They are just uh, incredible uh, now. I think they might have had to steal a few ideas from the Brits, but we won't brag about that too much. But I had gone to both Ireland and England in 85, and I was just knocked out by all the stuff in England. You can, everywhere you turn around, there's souvenirs and books and maps and stuff, and it's like a, a field day. And Ireland, a little bit here, a little bit there, but it, it wasn't organized. Well, they have turned it into probably one of their biggest industries now, and they, it's probably their biggest draw for tourism. And I just can't encourage you enough to do whatever it takes um, to find that link back to the old country, because we never had one when I was growing up. My brother and I didn't know, you know other than vague hints from that uncle that grand uncle or great uncle that would come over, that there are people over there that, that are still. So I, I found, as any of you genealogists found, the more you reach out from that circle, you're, you start to find uh, people that know people, and it's like a networking thing, like this LinkedIn that's on, uh, big on the internet now. It's the same idea. It just uh, it multiplies um, geometrically almost. Have any of you ever heard the uh, Rudyard Kipling? Um, it's kind of a tip for journalists, and it certainly applies to genealogists. I keep 
six honest serving men, who, what, where, how, why, and when. And that's kind of how I uh, want to approach this. So there's the who, that's who I am. And I'm going to show you some books that will give you a lot of uh, other who's. Now here's a map which we do have uh, copies of in the back when you leave, uh, if you haven't already gotten one. And it's, uh, it's an online thing at the moment. Uh, and it's a much more sophisticated version of this map that you've probably seen in gift shops over the years um, with all the names on there. It's kind of cool because some of you in the front rows can probably even read some of the names on there. And the reason they're so big is because when they did the map in 1890, uh, or when they did the survey of the names, those were the ones that were concentrated the most in that area with a huge representation. So um, that's, uh, that's some of the who and some of the where. And um, let's see now, did we figure out? Oh, to get back, I just hit backspace, right? Yeah. OK. Uh, Uh, no, that's, uh, that's okay. I was just thinking, uh, I'm going to wait on that one. So I'll go forward. And that was on your chairs. And I kind of put it there as a contrast to the one just before it. Did everybody get one of those? There's, I believe, some more back there. But it's a blank map of Ireland, basically, with just the county names. And I can't... Uh, can anybody tell me how many counties there are in Ireland? Well, the two is right. Uh, there's six in the north, and then there's 26 in the south. So there's 32. 32. And, um, you know, counties are important in Wisconsin and Illinois once you get outside of the big cities. They're not that important in the big cities. In, uh, in Ireland, each one of those counties is like a little country. And you know that, that doesn't that state, that country kind of look like a state you know very well? It's about the same size as Wisconsin, and just about if you made that bottom a little straighter, it's almost the same shape as Wisconsin. And yet, there's 32 jurisdictions, and Wisconsin is it that has 72 counties maybe? Yeah. And, uh, the, um, the biggest one, I think, is uh, Tipperary, geographically. Cork's pretty large. Mayo, Mayo is, uh, in a way, like two counties also, north and south. But for research purposes, knowing the county is, is a really great uh, hoop to get over. And I, I still haven't quite figured it out on the canes. I, talked to an elderly relative, and she said, oh, I think they were from Cork. And I thought, well, Cork makes sense because the, the woman that my Nicholas Kane married was from Kerry, right near the Cork border. So I thought, for a while, I thought that was good. Then everything I read about the Kane name said, they're a big name in Northern Ireland and in history of Ireland also. So I looked at a census record from 1920 um, and then 1930 that what year, we'll do a little history thing in a second, but what year did Ireland basically break free from England? It was after World War I, 22, 21, 22, yeah. And so our U.S. Census in, in 1930 started to separate out North and regular Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, the Irish Free State. You've seen that on censuses probably. And then if it wasn't the Irish Free State, it would say Northern Ireland. I'll be darned if one of my Nicholas Kane's sons said uh, on his Northern Ireland. Um, so now I've got the more logical answer that the family came from where most Kanes come from. I mean, they're spread around Ireland. But the other thing is um, a lot of you didn't, have any of those top 10 names, and I'm one of those people. And in a way, that is a blessing, because just thinking about being a Michael Smith or a Michael Sullivan, and that's the guy you're looking for, Joseph <laughs> Kelly. It's, it, oh, don't get me started, but 
you know, I work in a job now um, at a recruiting firm for uh, insurance actuaries in Chicago, and we get a lot of Chinese um, students that become expert mathematicians and get jobs in the industry. And you know, they anglicize their first names a lot, but they pick you know, like from a list of 10 first names. You know, and then their last names, there's, there's Chin and Wang, and there's about 10 last names that are real common. So you, you go in the database looking for a certain person, and there's 14 of them, and you have to figure out oh, no, which one of them is it. So my advice to any of you naming your children, if it's a common name, call your child Ebenezer or something. So <laughs> down the road, it stands out. Some genealogists give lectures saying, I want to be the child of a genealogist, or the descendant of a genealogist. So hopefully um, that'll make your research easier, or at least for the people that follow you. Um, I would like to now ask for a little group uh, participation. Uh, some of you were drafted. Some of you had a chance to uh, resist. and. Um, what I want to do is throw out a date and see if you can tell me what happened that year. And I'm going to start with uh, 3150 BC. Has anybody got that one? Where, where does your cards? Oh, okay. So what does it say? And if you could stand up for a moment when, <coughs> if I get your card. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. A new grange was constructed. Okay, now the tourists among you have been to Ireland. Did you see New Grange? It's outside of Drogheda. Not Drogheda, like they say in uh, the Thornbirds, but Drogheda. Took me a while to learn that one. But uh, it was before the pyramids, before Stonehenge, and it's still a very solid little rock structure that you have to kind of dip down like doing the limbo to get in. And it was uh, 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 the Druids, or pre-Druids even. Uh, but it's, it's on, in County Meath at the bend of the Boyne outside of Drogheda. So, um, yeah. Uh, when, when you're going north out of Dublin, to the airport's about here, and County Meath pops up, and before you know it, you're in, in Louth, and the town of Drogheda is right here. And that's where uh, uh, Newgrange is. So it's an easy uh, spot to hit. And you're, you know, like, don't let any of those Europeans tell you you don't have any history. Uh, <laughs> jump ahead a little bit. Uh, so we'll call that 3150 BC, or they're calling it BCE now, the, the, before the Common Era. How about 400 BC? Somebody got that one? Okay. Um, I have Navan Fort. Yes, right. Anyway, it says that the, the Celtics from Scotland and the Europeans went there and they started to build this fort. And apparently it's still standing in parts of it. So if your people predate the Celts, from Europe and Scotland, then you're really Irish. I mean, that's uh, when the, uh, the foreigners started coming in. See, we Celts, if I, I think most of us have Celtic blood if we're Irish, uh, have a lot to um, associate with the Germans. So don't let any German tell you he's better than you are. You were, your people were there. And I, my wife called me when I was in Ireland when we, before we were married to check up on me, I guess. And uh, one of my cousins answered the phone and started talking to her, and she kind of made herself clear, and she couldn't understand a word he said. He said she said it was like talking to a German guy. <laughs> and they're very guttural, the people that speak the actual language. Uh, it's all in the throat. Okay, so uh, that was Armagh. And I, um, this, the capital, this is the uh, seat of the church for all of Ireland. Even the, the 26 more Catholic counties uh, have their cardinal up here in, in Armagh. And the ironic thing is it was St. Patrick's Cathedral that was Catholic for all those years, and then the, the Anglicans took over and it became a Church of Ireland um, institution. Well, the 
Irish in the 1800s started to get a lot of uh, freedom, and you now have a Catholic cathedral facing the original cathedral, which is the uh, Church of Ireland Cathedral, right, right in Armagh. They're maybe 100 yards apart or 200 yards maybe. And I'm proud to say that one of my ancestors that was on that sheet, um, Francis Feenan Valley, was one of the big wheels in raising money to get that cathedral built. So I got to go there and see one of his uh, cousins sing in the choir while I was there. So that's kind of fun. And it was neat to know that their history goes back that far. How about 461? Um, before the person with the, that card uh, stands up, well, you can stand up, but before I ask you to say anything about it, um, does the date 461 AD or mean anything to anybody? Would you guess this? Yes, yeah, March 17th, 461. Uh, who's got that card? Oh, okay. St. Patrick, Ireland's primary patron saint, died in his hideaway near County Down Monastery that he had founded there. That's it. So he was a, a Welshman, I guess, and uh, he was born in Wales. Wales? Yeah, and he got caught, uh, he got kidnapped into slavery, I guess, and sent over to Ireland, and uh, he had studied in Rome and everything, and it was quite a story, and uh, he got rid of all those snakes. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen one snake on my trips to Ireland, but that was 461. 795, we're jumping ahead now, three, four hundred years. What can you tell us and where? Pronounced Rath Rathlin 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 Island, yes. Antrim. 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 Talks about the uh, Vikings came in and uh, raided the country. There, they started their fun and games. And uh, any redheaded Irishman you see, they have the Nor uh, Scandinavians to blame for that. That's where that originally came from, that gene. And I, I've got a, a bunch of it in my family. Um, and then 225 years later, or thereabouts, 1014. What have we got? Hi, Irish King Brian Bow was killed as his forces expelled the Vikings from Ireland. So it took that long. <laughs> Got him out of there. But they, they definitely left a lot of their genetic uh, information behind. So that's why we have the redheads. Um, and then uh, on the, somewhat on the same subject, how about 1170? Uh, the Angles and Norman invasion began to struggle in the course of in Passage, the town of Passage, down near Waterford, uh, I think it's right in here. There's Passage East and Passage West, both of which uh, I recommend. They're, it's a neat little uh, town to ha hang out in. But that was uh, King Henry II. Uh, remember uh, Peter O'Toole played that role in two different movies in the 60s? Lion in Winter. Lion in Winter, yeah. So he was a Norman, and he was about the third or fourth king after uh, William the Conqueror. So the, the, the Irish, uh, how did that go? The Normans who came to Ireland were so captivated by the Irish, they became more Irish than the Irish. That's how it goes. So uh, they did the same thing to the English in a lot of ways. They brought those longer words in the English language. So hand, arm, foot, shoe. Any short words comes from the Anglo-Saxon, but any word with four syllables or anything to do with the law or administrative things, you can blame it on the Normans, the French, the language of dis diplomacy and all that. So those strains are in all of us. Uh, 1204. Somebody's got 12. Oh, there it is. Construction of Dublin Castle began on the orders of King John. And John was the son of Henry II. And um, 
not exactly a hero in most people's eyes. Somehow he signed that Magna Carta with, uh, with a gun at his head almost, or whatever they had in those days. But uh, that was one thing he did, and he did it because you've heard the expression now, oh, that's beyond the pale. And the pale was the part of Ireland that the Normans and the Brits were trying to protect from all those savages out there to the west. Um, jump ahead to 1610. Kind of an ugly chapter. And where do we go for this one? County. The order was given for the eviction of the native Catholic population from lands earmarked for Protestant and plantations. From for lands earmarked for Protestant plantations. So this is King uh, James the first, the King James Bible, Queen Elizabeth's lovely cousin, Mary Queen of Scots' son. The, the cousin she couldn't quite get along with. He became, ironically, he was James VI of Scotland. He became James I of England, got the Bible going, and, and then also started the Ulster Plantation. They planted Scots and some Brits in the six counties to get them out of England so they wouldn't be competing with the true English or whatever for uh, land. So they got here and they found a few Irish, funny thing. And they had forced them west and southwest out of there. And that was uh, a few, 20, 30 years later, Oliver Cromwell got into it with a vengeance. But we won't get into that today. Um, 1847, that was uh, mentioned by Mr. Haldeman earlier, David. The U.S. Navy ship, the Jamestown, arrived uh, carrying goods for famine relief. That's right. The famine uh, years began in uh, 45, 46, when the potato leaves started turning black on them because the farmers had been just raising potatoes, 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 and not rotating their crops. And uh, it was a phony famine, really. It didn't have to happen. The, the food was there, it was raised. Ireland had an economy that was much more diverse than just raising potatoes, but the potatoes were all they'd let the farmers have. And uh, as, it's amazing any of us can still walk or anything with all that unbalanced diet of those years, but uh, the, the scandal of it, and I guess the British finally took some heat. This was during Queen Victoria's time. Uh, was that the food was there and it was being cultivated and raised, but the British were exporting it all for their uh, coffers. Well, that led to people coming to Janesville by way of New York and Canada. And so I guess we should be a little grateful. But, um, okay, we'll do one more. Uh, how about April, uh, 1916? Because that, that'll solve a problem we discussed when David was doing his thing. April 24th, right, at uh, Dublin, it says, yeah, and it's at the GPO, the General Post Office, and if you've ever been to an Irish bar, if they don't do at least one song about the Easter Rebellion in 1916 at the GPO, it's not an Irish singer. I mean, that is, it was during World War I and the nerve of the Irish. I mean, they were already getting a little encouragement from the Germans to, to fight off those Brits, but uh, the Irish were starting to get to a point where they would be uh, freed from England, and they got impatient. <laughs> it was, they just didn't, they got tired of the diplomacy, the stalling, the Brits' excuse was, hey, we're fighting this war in the, on the continent. And so they finally staged it, and they had a pretty successful run at it for a couple of days around Easter. <laughs> And they were holed up in the post office, and uh, then the heavy artillery came in. But the person uh, that has the card, um, Connolly, it's Patrick Connolly, isn't it, on the back, does it say? He was, James Connolly, that's it. Okay, I had it wrong. James Connolly and Patrick Pierce. Okay, and there were about six of them that were executed uh, because of that. And then within six years, the Brits finally backed off and said, uh, you can be your own people, and that's that. I, would, I invite anybody that really wants to get deep into this to come up, but this is a book called The Immigrant Experience, The Irish American, so it's more than just 
the famine people. This one is specifically famine, the Irish experience. It talks about the uh, broad scope of the famine, but we also have a book that actually gives famine names uh, in our other section uh, where we get to names. Here's a concise history of Ireland. Um, this one you might have read if you're in any kind of a book club, How the Irish Saved Civilization, about the monks in the 600s and 800s, 900s, uh, preserved a lot of documents from Greece and Rome and culture. I, uh, we have anybody that hates maps, because if you like maps a little, these are both great. One is about Ireland and one is uh, Celtic in general. Can anybody tell me where the other Celtic people are that aren't Irish, the other lucky people? Where they hang out? Yeah, Scotland's a good one. Yeah. Brittany? Wales. Wales and a uh, little part of uh, England. Cornwall. Cornwall, the Cornish, yeah. And um, I suspect there's two or three others that are maybe not quite as, as prominent as those. So that Celtic strain runs... Uh, in a lot of places. This was a public TV show. There is a videotape to it out of Ireland. Um, kind of emotional stuff. The Brits, even, they are so thorough with their research, it's scary. But this is their version, the Irish. And I was happy to see that there's like six authors and only one of them's from London. The, the rest are either Dublin or Galway. So that's encouraging. This is kind of a fun one, the Everything Irish book. Uh, kids would get into this even around the house and you, we do want to start getting them thinking that way. This is a little dry but it's uh, if you're into celebrities, uh, Irish biography. Um, Clark Gable, what's the movie? Who did he play? Parnell, the honorary uh, king of Ireland that got involved in an affair with the wrong woman and uh, his career just went up in smoke. Uh, so that's history. History is now history. Um, geography, where? Extremely important. And as you saw with the map, that was something we couldn't ignore. So we got a few maps up here. This is the one on the bibliography. It's, it's, they're really pretty consistent in Ireland and the British, other British countries. Uh, they use the Ordnance Survey maps as a basis for most of their uh, travel stuff, too. So. Those little townlands, you know, Irish political subdivisions are kind of interesting. You got the 32 counties, and then they have baronies, uh, which uh, there might be five or six in a county. Then you have towns and townlands. Well, the smallest unit is a townland. The parish is not, it's not quite like New, uh, Louisiana, where the parishes really are counties. But a parish in Ireland has upwards of uh, 20 different townlands. And the townland could be as small as the Foley Farm, but it's called Foleyville or whatever. And they give it a name. Or Glebe. Uh, does anyone know what a Glebe house is? It's church related. It's, it's like a rectory. And that'll be a whole uh, townland too. So my cousins that I was able to find in 1994 had a place called Milltown, and they had the mill there. And it's a small one, but it's been preserved pretty well. The, the country got interested, the government got interested in it and put a big you know, roof over it to protect it from deteriorating any further. So uh, that's the big deal about geography. This is my Bible. It's an expensive book, and I think you guys have this one, the uh, in General Alphabetical Index from 1851 to the towns, every little nook and cranny of Ireland. Now the juicy stuff is when you get into the, the county level. This is a new genealogical atlas of Ireland, which I believe you folks have, and it takes each county and, and gives you a map. So if you're able to get your hands on that book, you can then locate things within the counties, which is, is gold. Um, and uh, what I found with the writings that I've discovered, that they, they were pretty uh, meticulous about keeping track of where everything was. Because you know, the Irish people really started getting their land back 
by becoming tenants of the, um, the British guys. And so um, they would, the Griffiths evalu evaluation, has anybody heard of Griffiths? That was very important because it was a survey of who had what pieces of land and uh, what they were paying was the main reason for that one. This is a, a more detailed one just for County Armagh, Donegal, Londonderry, and Tyrone. So help yourself to these because it goes into, for example, now we, um, your parish was in Fermanagh, so that one's not on here. Does anybody have Donegal or Londonderry, or Derry, <laughs> excuse me? Oh, and in, in Dundalk? In Dundalk. Donegal. Oh, in Donegal, Donegal, County Donegal. Okay, so it'll take a parish, and then within that parish, which is like a, a township probably, they'll have this many different uh, townlands or family farms, whatever. Then you get your religious jurisdictions. It, it gets really, really fun. I guess that's what I like about genealogy the most is it, uh, it, it taps every skill imaginable. Now, one of the things we've got there, and I've got a slide on it too, is the Irish American Heritage Center. Did we take that one off? Or that's on there, okay. Uh, this is on, um, has anybody been to it already? Uh, it's, if you're gonna go to Chicago, this is a fairly easy way to do it. You don't have to get deep in. I mean, uh, I, Interstate 90 will take you very close. It's uh, the Eden's Expressway at Wilson Avenue, which is like the second or third exit and it's two or three blocks off. It's, that's a former junior high that they sold to the Irish American Heritage Center for a dollar back in 1990 or something. And the, all these Irish immigrant tradesmen have been working on it ever since and they've got a pub there and a, a library where they have this meeting on the last Sunday of every month. So if you just put that in your head and uh, there'll be a web, um, I think, uh, address for it. Uh, why did I bring that up? Let's see. Because, um, well, it's kind of like a 12-step program there. I mean, they, not that that's a problem with the Irish, but they, uh, they get together once a month and sit around this big table. And most months, people don't get into fights at these meetings. They, they're pretty <laughs> civilized. But I've been to a couple where People have gone storming out. Well, if that's the way you feel about that county, well, too bad for you. It's, it's funny. So I don't want to scare you away, but it's, uh, it's mostly very synergistic, shall we say, where people say, here's what I'm working on. I got these Monahans in County Tyrone, and it doesn't make any sense that they should be there. And what about the border? And Oh, yeah, I just worked on that last week. You know, and it's a group of, like I said, 15 or 20 people. So that's good, and I'm sure Milwaukee's got something even more uh, exotic and maybe Janesville will someday. Uh, I was told that 13% of the people of Janesville claim to be at least Irish at some level. Some part of them are Irish. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. This will be fun to learn more as we work on our quest for more information. Um, Irish settlement in Janesville uh, We'll learn more about that over the coming weeks. The library will have copies of the DVD and the book that's available about Janesville. I'm not sure exactly when they'll be ready for checkout, but we will be purchasing copies for the library. So if you don't wish to purchase a copy, but you'd like to look at one, we will have it here available. Um, but Irish settlement in Janesville. Uh, as you've heard already, they were one of the earliest groups to settle here. According to the census, in 1850, about 247 Irish immigrants were listed as uh, being in Janesville. And just 10 years later, 1860, about 1,200, or 16% of Janesville's population were Irish. Most lived in the old Fourth Ward. And St. Patrick's Catholic Church uh, was built in 1864, and it's still at 301 Cherry Street. And this information is from a wonderful book. I don't have a copy up here in front of me, but I believe it's on our display in the lower right corner, City on the Rock River, Chapters in Janesville's History. 
It was written by the Janesville Historic Commission in 1998. It's a fabulous book. It's also been digitized and it's available online through our website and we'll show you in a minute how to get to it. But uh, it's a wonderful resource. We have several copies and each chapter deals with a broad area uh, of Janesville's history, agriculture, education, business, uh, industry, um, the social life, religion, all kinds of things. So if you get a chance to browse through it, it's just wonderful. Here at the library, uh, we have a lot of resources to help you find information about Irish genealogy. And uh, of course, the main one is our library card catalog for books. We also have some special uh, local history resources that are online. We'll show you those in a moment. Um, we have a local history database, an obituary database, um, and Janesville's Past is the name of that digital collection that includes the book I mentioned earlier, City on the Rock River. We also have genealogy research databases, um, Ancestry Library Edition. That's the library version of Ancestry.com. Ancestry.com, of course, is free. You can also subscribe to different levels of it. But here at the library, on the library computers, you can use what we subscribe to. It's uh, what they call Ancestry Library Edition. And we'll show you that in a moment. It's not available through the website. To use Ancestry Library Edition, you must use the computers here at the library. And that's not our rule, it's the company's rule. But most, many public libraries throughout the country have Ancestry Library Edition. So if you're visiting relatives or you're doing some genealogy research out east or down south, go to the local public library or give them a call or check with them ahead of time, see if they subscribe to Ancestry Library Edition. And you can use it while you're visiting other libraries. Uh, Access Newspaper Archive is a wonderful source. It's free. It's a newspaper database. And Diana will demonstrate that in a moment. You can pull up articles from the Janesville Gazette. Up to about 1970, uh, the Janesville Gazette is indexed, but it's not complete. It's hit or miss. So you'll find articles from the 60s. You'll find articles from the 1860s, but you won't find a lot in the 1940s. But there is still a lot there. So Access Newspaper Archive is something you could search to find an obituary or article about someone in another part of the country or other countries that have newspapers that have been indexed. And then we have a genealogy web page we'll show you in a moment. We also have the Janesville Gazette on microfilm. So if you know the month or the year, you can come here, sit down with our microfilm machine, and find what you're looking for. However, there's no index to the entire Janesville Gazette on microfilm. So these indexes are what we work to create here and what you can find through Ancestry, or excuse me, Access Newspaper Archive. So we do have all the back issues of the Gazette. We also have the New York Times on microfilm up through uh, 1999. And we also have some of the index books as well, if that's something you're interested in. And then, of course, the very last thing on this slide is we have HPL, Hedberg Public Library staff. We're here to help you uh, with your search. So next slide. Um, this is just a short list of some of the Irish genealogy books here at the library. Our genealogy section you'll see on the optional tour is in the 929 of adult nonfiction, 929 through 929.3. Unfortunately, not all the Irish genealogy books are together on the shelf, but the catalog will help you. Uh, we can help you. We also have a handout on the back table. It says the Janesville Room at the top. And then it's a two-page list of books related to Irish genealogy. It's not all of them, but it's a good start. Our next slide, uh, websites and TV. As you know, genealogy has been becoming more popular in recent years. A couple of websites I wrote here, but they are listed on the back of your little handout. Um, the National Archives of Ireland, if you go to that website and click genealogy, and then click links. You'll get lots of links related to Irish genealogy. There's also the Irish Genealogy Toolkit. 
Yeah, uh, Dan reminded me of that in our conversation. That's also written on the back of your handout. It's a user-friendly website. And then some TV shows, Who Do You Think You Are? You may have seen that on TV or heard of it. And then a new show we just learned about from Dan. It's called Genealogy Roadshow. It's in Ireland, correct? And now it'll be uh, PBS is bringing an American version of Irish genealogy stories uh, to PBS. I think it started last week, and I don't know offhand what night it is. You think it's Monday, Diana? Uh, we think it's Monday night, so check your local listings or tune into PBS on Monday evening. And the next slide uh, is a list of more Irish genealogy websites. They are on the back of your program, so you don't have to worry about writing these down. Um, lots of information. Some, you'll just find what works best for you, uh, but I wanted to have that list there, and it is on your program. We're looking at the Hedberg Library homepage. Under the picture of the library is a red circle around research tools. Research tools is the starting point. And on the research tool page, you'll see popular subjects near the bottom. One of them is genealogy. If you click genealogy, it shows the genealogy web page. And the librarians on staff have pulled together these links for people to use for genealogy. And genealogy for beginners, Cindy's list you may have heard of has a good beginner's overview. And then we have general sites as well. The next screen. Uh, is the bottom part of the page, and you'll see where it says Vital Records, and I highlighted the second one on the list, vitalrec.com. It's a website that will allow you to get to the Vital Records office at, for any state in the country. Maybe your relatives were in, uh, uh, some of them died in Pennsylvania. You can contact Pennsylvania's Vital Records office to request copies of birth, marriage, or death certificates. Um, Below that, I highlighted genealogical societies and libraries. Here in Rock County, we're very fortunate. We have a Rock County Historical Society and a genealogical society. They have staff who will help you as well and information. If your relatives spend a lot of time in Pennsylvania, contact the county, uh, see if they have a local genealogical or historical society. You can become a member and have access to resources or contact them for help with your research if it's outside of uh, Rock County or Wisconsin. The next slide, um, where do you start? Gee, I, I get home and I, Sue talked about these great Irish genealogy books. How do I find them the next time I come to the library? Well, you can always ask staff for help or from home or on our computers in the uh, top right corner of our library website is where you can do a search in our online catalog. It's called RockCat. And I circled the box where you could just type Irish genealogy and press the enter key on your keyboard. It pulls up a list of books in our catalog about Irish genealogy. The one I circled is called Tracing Your Irish and British Roots. And what I want you to notice here is uh, the two things I circled is where you could click to get more information about this book. How many pages is it? Is it illustrated? In the center where I have those three red arrows, that's what you want to pay attention to before you go look for the book on the shelf. Before you look for the book on the shelf, under location, this tells that it's in the new book area. Under the call number, that's what you need to find it on the shelf. Don't write just the number, 929.107. Write down Q-U-I-L-L. That's the first five letters of the author's last name. What happens when you get to that number on the shelf, there'll be a lot of books with the same number. For the one you want, you need those letters, too, so be sure to write that down. And on the far right, that last arrow on the far right is the status. Well, it says staff use, because I have the book in here with me. So don't go looking for that on the shelf and waste your time. If it says on shelf, then you'll find it on the shelf. But with anything, always ask for help if you don't want to mess with the computer or don't understand something. The next slide is a particular book uh, that provided our uh, information, the person we wanted to use as our samples tonight. It's called It Wouldn't Feed Snipe, Irish Immigrants in Janesville. And we do have the book here. 
And it's, uh, we also have a history blog on our website. And a few years back, Laura Gottlieb, a retired reference librarian, did a story about this book. It's written by Thomas Baxter, and it tells the story of his relatives' uh, journey to Janesville and talks about why some of them went back to Ireland. And the next screen shows the catalog record for this book. And again, you see the title. Uh, we actually, it's as if you click the title to go into more detail on the book. It shows we have three copies here at Hedberg. And at the bottom, that big red arrow is pointing to subject headings. Those subject headings are a link. And if you see one, for example, it says, Irish Americans, Wisconsin history. If I click that subject heading, and I, it will pull up a list of other books that have that same subject heading. So that's why subject headings are important. If you click that link, it takes you to other books on the same topic. So what we're going to look at next under research tools, at the bottom of the page, you'll see a local history database. This is something we started here at Hedberg Public Library. Again, Laura, our retired librarian, was one of the people that got us going on this. Uh, we now have over 50,000 entries in our local history database, and it is keyword searchable, and we're going to show you a couple searches here. So you're going to go to the next page, and you'll see local history database. So you're going to click on it, and then at the bottom of the page, it says search the database. And once you click on that, you will get a search engine. Now notice there's three parts. Over to the right it says search by headline keyword. We also have subject headings in the next text box. And then you can search by an article date. What we do a lot here at the library is we search by headline or keyword. And one of the um, people that is in our book by Thomas Baxter, which is right here, is Mr. James Sheridan, a prominent, prominent Janesville citizen from the 1800s until the mid 20th century. And so we are going to um, click on search. And what we find here is the index that Laura created for this book. So she took the book and looked up every name that was in the book and put the page numbers. And you'll notice how many times he's mentioned. In fact, he's quoted right at the beginning. I think it says page one. There's a chapter on him and all kinds of information. Now we're going to follow him through our searches. So that's what we got on, that's one of the hits we got on him for local history database. We also want to show you another prominent Janesville resident, Paul Ryan, our candidate for vice president. When he announced in August of last year, we were inundated by reporters from all over the world, literally. And we were prepared because of our local history database. When you click we have him in as a subject. You could also do a headline search, but he has his own subject heading, Ryan Paul. When you go down to find records, you will see that we are now over 10,000 records for Mr. Ryan. Oh, 1,000, sorry. Over 1,000 records. Um, and we do have over 50,000 records in the database. So when the reporters came, we had two binders full of the newspaper articles on Mr. Ryan dating back to 1998 when he first announced he was running for the U.S. House of Representatives. And so when the um, reporters came, we were ready. And you'll notice the date over on the right. What we do when we, in, when we index to this database, we put the headline from the Janesville Gazette, so the whole article is not there, but it gets us to where we need to go if we're finding a specific article for a person. The dates on the right are the dates for the Janesville Gazette, and some of them do have page numbers, and you'll see 1998 up there, Republicans joins race for the House. We use this constantly. 
If you have questions, call us. If you want to search, you can do this from home. Oh, call and we'll do it for you. That's right. We will. So, we're back to Mr. Sheridan. Another thing we have started to do is we are entering obituaries from the Janesville Gazette. We go back right now to 93, and we do have volunteers that are doing even farther back. So you can put a name in. Again, last name first, Sheridan James, and at the bottom you'll have a search key, and once you click on that, you will find him. James J. Sheridan, Janesville. That was the residence at the time of death. Death date is August 12, 1953. He was born February 2, 1859. His spouse was Margaret Hogan. And it's in the August 13th, 1953 paper, the next day. So we have a piece of his history. So now what do we do next at the reference desk? Well, we go back to our research databases. One of the databases we have under magazines, newspapers, and periodicals, and that's going to be a link. You're going to click on that or touch it on your touch device like your iPad, we'll go to a, um, a resource called Newspaper Archive, which Sue mentioned. It has full text articles of the Janesville Gazette that have been scanned. And so on, when you click on it, you get to a page that looks like this. This is available through BadgerLink, through the Department of Public Instruction. It's not just for in-library use. You can do this at home. And when you, you scroll on the first page, you'll see Wisconsin. And at the lower right-hand corner, we did find a couple of years of a newspaper in Dublin that has been scanned, but it wasn't very much. But you'll see the Irish flag at the bottom. There is some newspapers from other countries here. So once we click on Wisconsin, we get a um, search page. And we put his name in. You've got over on the right, first name and last name fields, James Sheridan. And then underneath, we've got his date that it was in the newspaper, his obituary, August 13th, 1953. So at the bottom, there's a search button. And we click search, we get two hits. The first one is the front page article on Mr. Sheridan, the second hit is the continuation onto a next page of his obituary. And I believe the next slide is the photograph of the paper. So we're doing this at the desk constantly. And as Sue said, there are gaps. The um, Great Depression, the World War II, John F. Kennedy's assassination for some reason. Some of these papers are not on there. And this. Um, Newspaper archive goes up to March 31st, 1970 in, for the Janesville Gazette. And we have the film for the other years, so if we are missing something on newspaper archive, we can go to the film. Correct. To use the Badger Link databases that are free to libraries and schools in Wisconsin, you need a Wisconsin public library card. And if you... Uh, uh, if you don't reside in Wisconsin, for example, here at Hedberg, you may purchase a card. There is a fee if you're not a Wisconsin resident. But any Wisconsin resident outside of Rock County may apply for a Hedberg library card as well. Was there another question? Okay. All right. So we're back at that research databases page. And instead of clicking newspapers to the right, click people. And that next slide will show us where to go to go to Ancestry Library Edition, which is the library version of Ancestry.com. Now that's the one, remember, you have to use it on the computers here at our library or any other library that subscribes to it. You can't get it to it remotely. You can get to Ancestry.com, but you can't get to Ancestry Library Edition unless you go to the 
library that subscribes. The next yeah. slide shows you the beginning screen of Ancestry Library Edition. And you will want to do a search. You want to be sure and plug in as much information as you have. Now, keep in mind, the information you have may not be accurate, right? Keep in mind, the spelling of the name may not be accurate. Keep in mind, if you're looking at an index, that index may not be accurate, okay? Um, so don't give up. And if you try one source and it's not there, try something else. Or if you hit that brick wall, give us a call, stop by, and, and let us know how we can try to help. And if we can't help you, we'll try to point you to resources that can. Um, so that's another thing we stress. Don't give up. If you can't find it, be sure you give us a call or ask for help. Now on this page, I've entered Sheridan in the last name. I put in James J. That middle initial is important with a, a common name. Where it says, name a place where they lived. I started to type in Janesville. And as you begin to type, a list pops up and lists all the Janesvilles. And this is the one I needed, Rock, Rock County, Wisconsin. So I clicked it, it plugs it in the box. And then estimate birth year. If you don't know exactly, but you think you're close, plug it in. Now, before you uh, would click search to go on to the next slide, I want to point out two things. If you don't wish to search the entire database, maybe you know you just want to search for census records right now, or you just want to look at immigration records, in the lower part of the screen, it lists census collections or more collections. And those are links. So you can choose specific areas of Ancestry Library Edition to search. You don't have to search the whole thing at once. Especially if you, do, if you have a name like Robert Smith, you're going to get a lot of hits unless you narrow it down. But after you enter the information, you click the orange search button. And here's the first page of the results for James J. Sheridan. And at the very top, I circled a neat thing that's included is information from a family tree. A person can submit their family tree onto Ancestry, and then other people can uh, search for that information. And then below that, it starts to list the different results. You'll see the 1840 census, 1930 census, 1870. If you haven't worked with census records much, keep in mind, every 10 years when a census came up, they didn't necessarily ask the same questions. We found with Mr. Sheridan, we had to look at two or three or four different census to find out what year was he married, what year did he immigrate uh, to America, um, who were his parents. So don't look at just one year of the census. You want to explore various years. And the next slide shows a sample of the 1910 uh, U.S. federal census. It shows uh, his age at that time was 51. Uh, and his race, and his, that he's a male, and that he's the head of the household. It lists his wife's name, says he's married, that his father and mother are both from Ireland, and then it lists uh, James, Margaret, and the children, and their ages. In the top left corner is a button. Uh, we don't click it now, but it says View Printer Friendly. So if you want to print this out, you would click that View Printer Friendly option. It gives you a nicer copy to print out. On the right side, there's a little button that says View Original uh, Record. And if you want to look at the original census record, you can do that there. The next screen takes us back out to the Research Tools page. And on the left side, you see Janesville's Past. That's the digitized collection of books that we've written three grants over the last seven or eight years. Uh, the library staff here has to have some of our materials digitized, and we've been successful. If you click Janesville's Path, it lists the page where every book and its title or every collection of photos or the group of city directories, you can search them individually. At the very top in red, uh, that allows you to search everything in there at once. So if you click that button, search Janesville's Path, you jump out of the Hedberg site to where these are stored at the University of Wisconsin Digital Collection Center. And Janesville's Past is just one of many different collections from around the state. Many communities have had materials uh, digitized. It's fabulous. 
And you have two options here. The search the collection is if you want to look at pictures, or you can just click the pictures that you see there and browse different collections. But we're going to look at search only the full text. The next screen is where you can type your search terms. Put in an address, put in a business, put in a name. I put in James Space Sheridan and then click search. It tells me in the top there's 26 matches in the digitized collection related to James Sheridan. I put two of them here. The first one is the 1884-1885 uh, Janesville City Directory. And it has a long name, so we just call it the City Directory. The second one is from 1923. And below that, you see where it says on the page with the S's, page 365 has two matches. Let's look at that. So here's the actual page from the 1923 City Directory that lists the S's that include Sheridan's. And there's James J. Sheridan, his wife Margaret, real estate and insurance at 103 West Milwaukee, and then the H means his home was 265 South Jackson. So if any of you here live at 265 South Jackson, that's where James J. Sheridan lived at one time. Below that you see Sheridan James T, student, R, 265 South Jackson. So that's probably their son who lives at home at 265 South Jackson. Isn't that great? And the city directories are available from 1857, I think, up through 1931. We have them on microfilm, but they're also digitized and online. Then from 1931 to 59, they're just available on microfilm. But from 1960 to the present, we have the actual books in the Janesville room. And the next slide um, takes us to a story we came across in doing some research on Mr. Sheridan. I believe Diana found this in the Access Newspaper Archive. And it's dated Thursday, October 21st, 1920, the Janesville Daily Gazette. Right on the front page in the middle, Irish demand for freedom, not religious revolt. And then it says theater packed. It turns out there was a meeting an open meeting for anyone interested, Irish or not, to come to the Myers Theater. Remember, during that time is when Ireland was fighting uh, for its freedom, and it was sort of a rally. They had three famous national speakers come and speak, and you can read all about it in the Gazette. Um, what's interesting is the very last paragraph of this article, which I don't show you here, it explains that James Sheridan presided over the meeting, so he introduced the speakers, and that um, an orchestra played music and um, Gaelic songs were sung. So it was a festive event, but with a lot of import to the people here and how to support uh, their homeland. And they had three national speakers who came to Janesville to speak. So it was really a, a, a neat find. And as always, anytime you need help, you can contact us directly. Uh, our contact information is on the program handout you have today. Um, we thank you for coming. May the luck of the Irish be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.